Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's good to see you all online here this morning, and uh, I trust that the volume is working and you guys can see everything here. Uh, just a quick, uh, quick look. Excuse me. Uh, good morning to Shirley and Anne and Doris and the Philippex, Randy, Janice, Michael, Delzers. Um, uh, the the uh, Lockin Clan is watching as well. So, uh, good morning to everyone here. Uh, as you are watching here, a couple of announcements to pass along to you. Um, as always, it's good to uh, share uh, this with uh, those on your other social media pages uh, simply by just doing a quick share if you're able to do that. Also, glad to see everyone identifying themselves. Uh, it's good just to kind of let you know uh, who's watching and where you're watching from. And so that's always kind of an encouragement. Uh, good morning from Paula. Okay, yeah, the Benhams too. Good to see you guys as well online. Um, also here, as far as announcements, uh, we'll cover some of the different announcements in the uh, church service. Uh, this week, we have a lot of meetings here at St. Paul's. We're doing those and conducting those meetings on Zoom. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with Zoom, it's just basically a platform uh, for allowing us all to meet together on the computer screen like this. And so there'll be meetings on Monday and Tuesday. Uh, check the church calendar all the time uh, for those different announcements. Uh, let's see, other things here to mention. Oh, women's Bible study on Tuesday. We're rolling up our sleeves, right? On uh, Tuesdays, the women's Bible study uh, here at the church at 1030. They are meeting uh, in person. And so we had our last Bible study last Tuesday uh, for the women. And then the men are typically meeting on Thursdays at 645. But this Wednesday, uh, we will not be meeting uh, because I will be on vacation. Also keep in mind, Wednesday, uh, we have our midweek divine service that started a couple weeks ago that goes from let me get this right memorial day to labor day uh six o'clock on wednesdays and uh we are doing on wednesdays it'll be the service before the coming sunday uh so the the wednesday before and sunday will be the same uh service so we did trinity uh trinity sunday today and we celebrated uh, the festival of the holy trinity on last wednesday so that's kind of how it works okay i believe those are all the announcements um let's see good to see roger and don watching as well good to see you guys all right so what are we doing today get this we are in our last study of romans okay last study of romans uh really need to see we have been going through 47 studies to get through the epistle of romans and we are in our last study today we're looking at all the chapter 16 together today and uh, man, after we're done today, we can just put a big bow on that and say, you know, it's awesome. We got through uh, Romans uh, together uh, here at St. Paul's. So let's turn to our Bibles. If you have our Bibles, chapter 16 of Romans. And I would like to go through and uh, read just a couple portions of that for you. And so if you turn to Romans 16, and as you're doing that, let's have a, a brief word of prayer here. Um, before we read the scriptures and jump into things. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing of your word. We thank you that it imparts to us not only knowledge and understanding, but comfort uh, in the gospel, assurance in Christ, uh, the hope of everlasting life. Bless us as we study and as we partake of your gifts today in church as well. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, guys. Um, we're going to look at Romans 16 here. And what we're going to do is I'm not going to read all of chapter 16. Uh, the very beginning <clears throat> of Romans here is going to be uh, Paul doing some greetings, some personal greetings. And so let me just read a couple of verses here, verses 1 and 2. It says, I commend you, I commend to you our sister uh, Phoebe, a deacon of the church. And um, at, uh, oh my goodness, I need to pronounce this. Uh, Sankiria, so that you may welcome her in the Lord as is fitting for the saints and help her in whatever she may require from you. For she has been a benefactor of, of many and of myself as well. And then Paul goes on to give personal greetings to people in Rome. And so he does that from verses 3 all the way through down to verse 16. And today, we're going to cover that just briefly, his greetings. But today, we're specifically going to look at verses 17 uh, through 20. And that's what I want to really, really focus our attention on today. So as we look at 17 through 20, it says this, I urge you, brothers, to keep an eye on those who cause dissension and offenses in opposition to the teaching that you have learned. Avoid them. For such people do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, 
but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the simple-minded. For while your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you, I want you to be wise in what is good and guileless in what is evil. The God of peace will shortly crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Okay, And then Paul goes on. To do, to do a couple more greetings, and then verse 25, he gives this really nice benediction uh, to the um, Christians in Rome. Now, with that in mind, let's look at our sheet. Now, uh, as you may or may not know, we, we have these sheets that we're using here at St. Paul's. And let me pull that up for us. Uh, pull that up here. And these sheets uh, are basically, again, summarizing our thoughts as we wrestle with this scripture passage, as we uh, think about its uh, applicableness to our local church setting. And let us read here this, this beginning paragraph as it covers the very uh, uh, beginning portions of chapter 16. In the early portions of chapter 16, the Apostle Paul shows us the urgency for encouraging each other as Christians. That is to say, it is good to greet and welcome one another in the church. However, even though the church is called to, to be welcoming, we must always understand that the church never compromises regarding false teachings. The church must be welcoming, but not at the expense of compromising the doctrines of the faith. Okay, so what we're seeing here as we think about this is the Apostle Paul is very, very welcoming uh, to all these individuals. And, and that's the nature of the church. The, the church itself, um, as Christians, uh, we are very welcoming. Uh, we, we greet people in the name of Jesus. We're excited when people walk through the doors of the church. We are excited to invite people to come to church. Um, indeed, we want to be extremely welcoming to anyone and everybody around us. However, uh, as we welcome we welcome the individual to enter into the church context to receive God's gifts for us to enter in as sinners, uh, acknowledging that we all have the sinful nature, uh, to come in as poor, miserable sinners, to confess our sin and then receive God's gifts. And so when we welcome, we welcome people as sinners to come and receive the gifts of God, uh, the forgiveness of sins with us. I've heard, I've heard it said before, and I love this, um, that Evangelism and outreach uh, for the church is one beggar simply telling another beggar where the free warm bread is and to come and receive those gifts with them. Uh, it's a beautiful explanation. But what we want to understand is that the church needs to indeed be welcoming. Uh, I've heard this phrase before that it must have open doors. And that's true. The church has open doors. However, as the church welcomes, as the church is welcoming, we must be understanding that we do not compromise the scriptural truths of who Christ is, what the church is about, which is his word and sacraments, and that we don't compromise uh, the fundamental teachings of the faith. Uh, there's a note here. It says on our sheet here, on our sheet here, um, it says, see the warning in Revelation 2. Uh, verses 18 through 28. Now, if you consider the book of Revelation, uh, the very beginning portion, the, Apo or the Apostle John speaks to the different churches uh, in Revelation, in this book of Revelation. And each of the church has something going for it and then something uh, not going for it. Uh, so each church has a problem. Now, this specific church, let me turn to that page, in Revelation 2, uh, verses 18 through 28. Let me pull that up. Revelation 2, 18 through 28. This is the church called Thyatira. And this Thyatira church, uh, what it has going for it uh, and what it doesn't have going for it is this. Uh, Jesus says, but I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel. Let me back up to verse 19. He goes, I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance. I know that your last works are greater than the first. And so this church has love and faith and service. Uh, we could perceive them as maybe being a very welcoming church. However, to their detriment, uh, this church tolerated the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet and is teaching uh, my servants and practicing fornication and eating food sacrificed idols. So, so there's a woman, her name's Jezebel, and uh, this, this, this woman Jezebel, who is teaching false doctrine. 
and the church itself is tolerating it. Uh, it is it is a very very uh, tolerating church of false doctrine. So it's very welcoming, but it doesn't have the backbone to stand up and to call out sin in the church itself. And so that is one of the things we want to keep in mind that 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 Paul is telling us to to welcome. He's welcome. He's showing us how to welcome one another, but not at the expense of again false teaching. Okay, let's move on. Let's move on. Uh, in verses. 17 through 20, that focus that we read here today, Paul takes a moment to give a warning. He warns the Christian church to be on alert for those who are creating divisions and laying forth stumbling blocks. While it may be hard to see in the English language, the way this is written in the original language is to emphasize the watching over the divisions and stumbling blocks caused by the people in the church. Now, let me, let me, let me explain that. In other words, while it is easy to look to the people creating the problems in the church, okay, it is more beneficial to be alert to the tactics of division and the smooth talk that brings forth trouble in the church via or through certain people. And so, so Paul is, 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 is really in, in the original language here. Again, uh, it's tough to pick up in the English language, but when you when you look at the original language um, of this, uh, the, the attention is definitely, you got to be aware of these people in the church that cause division and stumbling blocks. But, but the focus and the way it's written is it's more of an attention on the actual division that is being caused and the stumbling blocks themselves. In other words, we don't want to give too much attention to the ones causing the troubles, but we want to make sure to be aware of the division and the stumbling blocks that are occurring in a church, in the church in Rome. Uh, he's telling them to be aware of that. And that's applicable for all churches, okay? Let's continue here. We must remember that the early church, okay, right after Jesus' resurrection, did not exist in peace. Now, it's so important for us to understand, as we consider that the divisions and obstacles in the church, it is important for us to understand that the church has always existed with conflict, Okay? Um, okay, so right after Jesus' resurrection, it did not exist in peace. No, the early church was quite messed up. In fact, the church has always been messy. Okay, people who set out to look for the perfect church, and get this, have better luck finding a unicorn jumping over a pot of gold at the end of a rainbow. The church has always been messy and always will be. For example, the church in Corinth, I love these descriptions. The church in Corinth was full of drunken, crazy, naked weirdos living in the big city and out of control. Okay, The churches in Galatia, they were full of legalistic nitpicks that were frantically concerned with outward appearance and not faith in Christ. The church in Thessalonica, okay, the church in Thessalonica was a group of people sitting in their lawn chairs waiting for the rapture while calling in sick to work because they have it all figured out when Jesus is coming back. And John, okay, uh, John, the Apostle John, he wrote to a group who had no love for their neighbor while believing that Jesus did not come in the flesh, okay? The point being, okay, the point being, and as already stated, the early church was messy because we humans are messy. We are sinners, we should not expect, we should expect, excuse me, we should expect the mess and be ready to address divisions and obstacles, conflict and more. Okay. Um, I know as a pastor, one of the things that happens, and, and unfortunately, I don't know how to say this uh, kindly. Um, well, it is kind, it's because it's true, but it's hard for us to hear. Uh, there's always going to be a group of Christians in communities that jump from church to church to church and they are seeking out a perfect church and they come into a church and they see the mess of the church and then they get disgusted and it's like oh my goodness this church is full of mess or things are not working uh, people are, are clicky or hypocritical or there's struggles and then they throw up their hands and they go to the next church and they come in to a new church and uh, they have this uh, excitement in their eyes about this new church and how great it's going to be. And they come and they tend for a while and then they see how messy it is. And they just keep on seeking out um, that perfect church. My friends, the point is this. There's no such thing as a perfect church. There's only a perfect Savior. No church is perfect because it is full of sinners. Okay, So when the world says, you know, I'm not going to go to church because it's full of hypocrites. I'm like, well, what do you expect? 
we're, we're full of sinners. Of course there's hypocrites in church. Of course there are sinners in church. That is what the church is for. The church is not some museum of righteous and perfect saints. The church is the place where we sinners come to receive forgiveness, life, and salvation. We admit it. I mean, I just, just think about this. I get a little frustrated on this as a pastor, but think about this. We admit this, don't we? We come into St. Paul's and we do some announcements, which are really nice to hear the announcements, a nice green, a nice welcome. And then we sing a hymn. And that hymn sometimes is to what? Allow late people to come in, right? Uh, to sneak in that back to you. And then what do we do? I said, let us stand. And we say, together, I, a poor and miserable sinner, have sinned and thought word and deed. We, we all just acknowledge together that we're all messed up, that we've messed it up the whole entire week. And that is that what that confession of sin is all about. And so we're admitting we're not a perfect church. We admit that we need Jesus. We admit that we have stumbling blocks and so forth. And so it's important for us to understand Again, that there's no perfect church and that divisions and conflict are going to be present in the church because the church has sinners. It will always be here. The church has always been messy. It always will be messy. Okay. But with that said, okay, but with that said, um, and so since the church is always full of sinners, there will always be individuals who cause division and create obstacles. Again, it is important to not direct the attention to the individuals but instead to direct attention to the problems created by certain individuals. Why? Because when divisions and obstacles are created in the church, it pulls the whole church, especially, get this, especially the simple, naive, and gullible, away from the central teachings of the church. Okay? Paul says something similar in 1 Timothy. He tells the young pastor, Timothy, not to pay attention to silly myths and fanciful family trees. Pastors and Christians are to keep the main thing the main thing. We keep alert for divisions, for divisions create factions, and factions tear us away from the word and sacraments, and direct our attention away from confessing our own sin, to picking out the sin in everyone else. We keep alert towards obstacles because obstacles can mute the word and sacraments. Indeed, the devil loves when a church is overtly busy with silly mission statements, foolish ministry planning, and endless planning meetings that result in the church not giving or receiving the word and sacraments. Divisions take the church away from what is most fundamental, the core doctrines of the church. Think of the small catechism as that which is central to our theology. Obstacles cause the church to think that it is going somewhere grand, but in reality, the church is only spinning its wheels. Okay, so let's let's just pause there. Again, it's importance. Um, it is important. Uh, it is important for us as as a church. It's important for pastors, especially for pastors, to be concerned about the flock always hearing and receiving the word and sacraments and so um i'll get off maybe a little bit in the ditch here but but this is one thing that new pastors uh typically end up doing every pastor including myself every single pastor that comes out of the seminary ends up failing on this um a pastor will find some small little problem in the church and maybe it's not you know uh maybe it's uh uh, whatever problem it is, or maybe an error in, in, in an aspect of the church, or maybe there's a problem in the liturgy, or there's some something in the church. And the pastor, kind of like a uh, bulldog, will grab a hold of that. And he'll grab a hold of that, and he will blow the entire church up over that one small thing. And as a result of that, what happens? Now here's the detriment. Now, the pastor can be totally right in grabbing hold of that issue, but where the pastor can fail miserably is that he will fail in what? Getting that word and sacrament to the ears of his people. It can become an obstacle. Uh, now, again, I'm not saying that we, again, going back to the very opening part of this text here, it's not that we endorse or we embrace errors in the church. However, we have to always make sure that when we address an error or we confront something, that we don't do it at the expense of what? Creating an obstacle for the word sacrament. Uh, hopefully that's coming through making sense. Um, let me just pause for a couple comments. Uh, 
Uh, Dustin says, if there was a perfect church, the person looking for the perfect church would mess it up. <laughs> right? Right? Good one, Dustin. Um, yeah, and then Betty says, there's nothing new under the sun. Churches are the same now as they were then. Absolutely. Uh, the human nature that we have as sinners is no different from the saints of the Old Testament as well as the saints from today. And, and, and get this, we as Christians, we are simultaneously saint and sinner. We have this old Adam. And so this old Adam will flare up and act just like the world. Uh, but the difference is for us as Christians, we have the Holy Spirit and his word and sacrament coming. So we are constantly called to fight against that old Adam that we have. Okay, constantly called to fight against that old Adam. But back to that point again, the, the, the key uh, for any pastor and leadership as a church is always to make sure, again, that the word and sacrament is going forth, uh, that people are hearing and receiving uh, Christ and his gifts uh, in good times and bad. I mean, Paul says this to Timothy, he says, preach the word in season and out of season uh, to constantly give the gifts no matter what is going on. And that is what can never be compromised. And that is really what Satan wants to do. Satan wants to create obstacles and divisions to divide us away from that word and sacraments, to create obstacles from us receiving and hearing that word and sacraments. And when the Satan does that, that's where he has us, right where he wants us, uh, is to take us away from God and his gifts. Uh, think of it this way too. Uh, Jesus uses the example of the vine and the branch, and we as branches must always be connected to the vine, because as soon as we're disconnected from the vine, which is Christ and his gifts and his word for us, then we become dead branches that wither and die. And so the, the, the obstacles and the divisions are to separate us always from the vine, but we're always called to be connected to that vine because when we're connected to Christ through his gifts of word and sacrament, uh, there's life and salvation uh, for us as a church. Okay. All right. Let's go back to our sheet here. Okay. So it is important to know as a church when to address divisions or obstacles. Again, this is what we're talking about just recently. For the pastor and leaders, the primary question should always be, how does this affect the word and sacraments? What this means is that it is often beneficial to ignore petty divisions in the church because addressing a petty division may only add fuel to the fire and then cause more significant division resulting in pulling people away from the word and sacraments. Also, sometimes it is wise to simply step over or around a small obstacle in the church because trying to remove a small obstacle may divert too much time away from the word and sacraments. Okay? However, when division begins, when divisions begin to divide the already existing unity in the church from the word and sacraments, and when an obstacle obstructs people from the word and sacraments, the pastors and leaders must work to address these harmful situations. Again, again, uh, as we think about this here, um, again, we want to understand it is always about making sure that the church and the people of the church, the sheep of the church, are always hearing and receiving God's gifts. Uh, uh, it doesn't matter in my as we think about it, it doesn't matter the size of the church it doesn't matter uh, the, the the quality of the music it doesn't matter um, the the prestige of the church building what matters is that the flock the sheep are hearing and receiving the word and sacraments I mean the the, the book of Concord um, our book of Concord defines this if you think about how do we define a church the church is defined by believers Christians sheep gathering around and receiving God's gifts. That's the church. And so where you have the word and sacraments being delivered and where you have sheep receiving it, that is the church. It does not matter the size of the church. It doesn't matter the prestige of the building. It does not matter the eloquence of the pastor. It does not matter. None of that matters. But when you see sheep connected to the word and sacraments, there you have a vibrant and alive church. Uh, it's that simple. But when you disconnect the sheep from the word and sacraments, uh, when there's a division, uh, because if you think about it, we have the word and sacraments and the sheep are all gathered around that. When there's a division, then what ends up happening is you have sheep not following the word and sacraments, but the sheep following other people. And this is what Paul uh, hits in, 
in 1 Corinthians. He says, some of you follow Paul, some of you follow Apollo, some of you follow uh, these individuals. Uh, but did these individuals, did they die for you? No, they didn't. They didn't die for you. Christ died for you. Uh, there's not many baptisms in the Christian faith. There's not many altars. There's one altar. There's one baptism. There's one Christ that we're all joined to. But division has a way of taking us, taking us away from uh, that one Christ. And then we end up following different persons and different um, sects, uh, S-E-C-T, uh, different groups. And then when that happens, we are no longer receiving from that one word and sacrament. And then obstacles in the church can be uh, laid forth that we stumble over uh, either from receiving or getting that word and sacrament or we stumble over it into the ditch and we're not hearing and receiving God's word for us. And so this is what is so incredibly important for us to understand. Um, uh, Marcia says, sheep uh, follow the word and sacraments, you bet. And that is why our, uh, again, that's why our liturgy is so important. The word liturgy is consistently delivering the word and sacraments to us uh, as his sheep. Okay, good stuff. Uh, it's rich. This is great stuff. All right, let's move on. All right, we have these two paragraphs left. Okay, so people who create division and lay down obstacles so that sheep are kept from the word and sacraments can be classified as wolves. And how are wolves to be treated? They must be fought against. Wolves are not about uplifting the word and sacraments, but are about feeding their appetites. Wolves want power and control and their way in the church and often do it through smooth talk and flattery. Wolves usually do not bite with loud bloody bites, but seduce sheep into the dark woods through eloquence only to devour them in the shadows. Okay, and so uh, when we think about a wolf, um, I think too often, in my humble opinion as a pastor, too often times uh, we're quick to label somebody a wolf. And, um, and oftentimes what can happen is pastors, and I, I'm guilty of this myself, pastors can uh, take uh, the, the staff and they can throw a heavy staff against a sheep. Uh, but then when it comes to a wolf, they cower and they run like a hired hand. Um, the pastor is always to be gentle and firm to the sheep so that they hear the word in sacraments. Um, and, and, and the pastors are called to gently rebuke and to encourage and to steer sheep always to the word in sacraments. Um, but when it comes to a wolf, uh, wolves are not to be tolerated. Uh, under shepherds, pastors and leaders are called to be very stern against wolves because a wolf is not about the sheep hearing the word in sacrament. The wolf is about their own appetite, their own agendas, their own opinions, their own power and control. And so uh, wolves are called to be opposed uh, throughout all the scriptures to be opposed. Uh, Paul says this in Timothy and Titus in the pastoral epistles. He says this over and over and over to uh, Timothy the pastor and Titus the pastor. He says these words, watch your sound doctrine. Always watch the doctrine. Always watch the word. Protect those. Pastors are stewards of the mysteries of God, of the word and sacrament, because the pastor's job is to always to make sure that the sheep are receiving God's gifts, hearing Christ, hearing Christ's voice, and receiving his precious sacrament. And so when wolves come along, uh, nine times out of ten, it's actually ten out of ten, wolves are about feeding their own appetite, getting the tension off of Christ onto them and their power and their control and manipulation. And that's, again, where pastors are called to oppose the wolves for the sake of the sheep so that the sheep can always hear and receive Jesus. Uh, it's beautiful. It's great. It's great to think about. All right, let's finish this last paragraph. But as a church, pastors and parishioners must remain steadfast, okay, to the word and sacraments. The chief parts of our doctrine neither giving into factions nor stumbling over obstacles. We must always be rooted and built up in Christ. And tragically, when needed, pastors and leaders must enact discipline upon wolves. Not as a power struggle, okay? So it's not, the it's not a power struggle of the pastor, but to protect the sheep from wolves seeking to take them away from the word and sacraments, okay? Um, and, and, you know, we should actually mention this too, uh, this is the place in the time that at times uh, pastors 
uh, can actually be wolves uh, in sheep's clothing or, or in shepherd's clothing. Uh, so we must keep that in mind too. And that is where we have our polity uh, set up that when a pastor um, goes from being a shepherd to a wolf, uh, when the she when the when the pastor uh, is misguided, that's where we have our polity, uh, where we have our bishops or district presidents that can come in and enact church, church discipline upon those pastors uh, who are denying the word and sacrament from their sheep as well. And so we must keep in mind that not only does that happen with uh, uh, parishioners. But pastors can actually be wolves. In fact, uh, is it Ezekiel? The book of Ezekiel talks about this quite, quite frankly. It talks about uh, false shepherds, uh, shepherds who use the sheep uh, for their own good. That they will um, shear the sheep for their own warmth. They will kill the sheep for their own bellies, and that pastors use and abuse uh, flocks for their own end game of filling their bellies. And so. Uh, it really is quite simple. It all comes back to the word and sacraments uh, for the, the church to receive that and for pastors to deliver that at all costs. And when there's obstacles, we either step around them or we demolish them. When there's division, we seek to heal those divisions uh, so that the church might remain steadfast in that word and sacraments for us. Uh, that's great. That's great. Um, you know, one thing to think about as a way of concluding, it's tentative to get, hold on here one second. Right over here. So when it comes to, uh, just as a way of summarizing this, when it comes to our unity and it comes towards um, being uh, steadfast, um, we as a church, you know, we, we subscribe to the scriptures. And I love this. This is our this is our Lutheran study Bible that we have. We subscribe to the scriptures. And how do these scriptures shape and form the way that we view life and the way that we comprehend? Well, we have subscribed to the Book of Concord. And so here's our, our, our authoritative um, scriptures. This is how we understand these scriptures applied in our life. And then how do we practice uh, this Christianity? And that's right here in the Lutheran Service Book. And so, so for me as a pastor and for us as leadership, we're always preaching and teaching the word. Um, according and, and applying it according to how we understand it as Lutherans and we practice it together as Lutherans according to the Lutheran service book. And so uh, when it really comes down to it as, as a pastor and as, as, as Christians, um, I'm not preaching anything new. Uh, I'm not doing anything new as a pastor. I'm merely repeating and delivering to you uh, what the saints have received from uh, ages and ages and, and years before. And we walk in this rhythm of receiving God's gifts, hearing from the scriptures, singing our hymns, uh, practicing our faith and, our, and, and understanding this faith and this Christianity in our lives um, according to the Lutheran confessions. Uh, it's just beautiful. It's great. And we do that from one generation to the next, passing it down continually. That's great. Um, Marsha says, so thankful to God I became LCMS. Uh, me too, Marsha. Uh, I've never heard so much about the importance of sound doctrine as I have since becoming a member of the LCMS out of evangelicalism. Absolutely. Um, we must understand doctrine shapes our practice. Doctrine from the scriptures shapes how we view the world. And so if you have false doctrine, you have bad fruit. You have good doctrine. That good doctrine then influences us in how we understand life and how we practice as Christians. And so uh, doctrine is nothing more, as we covered here this last Wednesday in our, in our midweek service, doctrine is nothing more than the teachings of Jesus, uh, the teachings of Scripture for us. All right. Okay, uh, back to that sheet just as a way to review. Um, back here it says, it says, may the Lord strengthen us by his gospel to keep us steadfast. And that's the key, you guys. As a way of summarizing Romans here, uh, Romans is a book that teaches us about the gospel, teaches us about the Christian faith. And we've been studying it for the last year. This is our Christian faith as written by the Apostle Paul for us, for us to hear in our ears and to understand in our minds and hearts uh, this Christian faith that has been handed down to us uh, from uh, that church in Rome all the way to the present age. And we, we cherish this scripture, we cherish this word, we cherish this doctrine um, here at St. Paul's um, day in and day out. All right. With that in mind, uh, we are at 10.05. Uh, as a way of reminder, a couple things. We have our church service here starting at 10.30. 
Uh, 10, 15, uh, we'll probably be going online. 10, 15, 10, 18 going online for those of you still watching online. Uh, just a reminder, uh, we have our, our communion throughout the middle of the week, uh, Tuesday through Thursdays. Uh, for those of you who are wanting, uh, we have our midweek service as well on Wednesday. And then um, next week, in the upcoming weeks, we'll be shifting into another Bible study uh, here at St. Paul's. I'm still working it out. I'm going to visit with the elders this afternoon, have some ideas, want to kick around with them. And uh, we'll, we'll reveal that to you here in the upcoming weeks of where, where we will be studying next as a church, uh, what scripture we'll be studying next as we drink from this fountain of God's word for us. All right. Okay, with that in mind, uh, let's have a closing prayer. And we will go from there. Let's close with a word of prayer. And Luther's morning prayer here. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. All right. Amen. Well, it's good to see all of you online here today. And uh, again, we'll be starting church services here in about 24 minutes. And so uh, if you are coming, you've got about 24 minutes uh, to uh, hop in the car and come on down. Uh, if you're watching online, uh, if you're watching online, uh, give a few minutes here to grab a cup of coffee and then uh, tune back in at about 10.15, 10.16. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Good to see you guys. God bless you. Um, Word and sacrament, right? Always receiving. We're going to hear that in the sermon today. Receiving God's gifts. Always receiving. Always receiving. Connected to the vine in Jesus. And when there's obstacles, when there's divisions, uh, they need to be either avoided or snuffed out because we all need to be connected to Jesus and his gifts for us. All right. Lord bless you and keep you.